Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, Managing Virus Threats with Proper Air Filtration. Our speaker today is Kyle Peterson, who is the Healthcare Segment Manager for Campbell USA. In Kyle's role, he has overall responsibility for cultivating, managing, and supporting Campbell hospital and healthcare clients throughout the US. Prior to managing the healthcare segment, Kyle managed Campbell's national account program exposing him to a broad spectrum of air filtration applications across a wide variety of industries. Through his time with Camphill, Kyle has become an expert on Camphill's lifecycle cost analysis tool that is, identifies the most effective filter strategy for every operating condition based on overall lifecycle cost. Kyle is also an accomplished speaker on various ASHRAE standards and guidelines instructing healthcare facilities on air filtration strategies to provide quality indoor air, to maintain compliance with proper standards, and to reduce total cost of ownership. So before we begin our Lunch and Learn, I would like to remind the audience to please feel free to submit questions at any time using the question answer feature on your webinar toolbar. To address your questions for the last part of this event, we have invited a panel of air filtration experts to join us for a Q&A session. And if you happen to have any technical questions, please use the chat feature and your question will be addressed as soon as possible. Please note the information on how to view the recording of today's webinar will be sent in a follow-up email. And now I'd like to turn the time over to our presenter, Kyle Peterson. The floor is yours, Kyle. Thank you, Lynn, and welcome everyone. I uh, am very pleased to have this opportunity to spend some time with all of you today. I must say, I do look forward to the time when we can start doing these things in person again. Uh, I've uh, just recently relocated to Nevada and uh, just this last Monday, they've opened up vaccination appointments for the entire population. So hopefully other states are uh, tracking the same way and we will be able to have these gatherings again soon. And uh, in line with this idea of safely having large groups of people congregate together again, the topic of this presentation is managing virus threats with proper air filtration. And obviously COVID-19 takes center stage here, but as we'll see, all of the viruses, bacteria, and other dangerous particles we encounter every day in healthcare settings are similar in size to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So the concepts I'm going to cover today will apply equally in a post-pandemic world. So COVID-19 has impacted virtually every aspect of society across the globe. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine a silver lining around this, but poor indoor air quality is a root cause for many human illnesses. According to the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, 50% of all illnesses are either caused by or aggrav aggravated by poor IAQ. It's a pervasive problem, and frankly, it's a problem that's been largely ignored for far too long. So if this pandemic somehow generates a greater awareness around the importance of indoor air quality, well, maybe there is an upside here that we can all benefit from in the future. So many businesses have been hit hard. Lost sales and profitability, staffing shortages, and supply chain interruptions have been the norm. And it goes without saying that the healthcare industry has been particularly hard hit. From the sacrifices, sacrifices made by frontline workers to those of you who have worked tirelessly to keep your facilities safe for both patients and employees, we all owe you a great debt of gratitude. And the air filtration industry has had a rather unique experience through this. On the one hand, demand for our products has been completely off the charts. But at the same time, we've had to manage this increased demand with limited staffing and massive supply chain disruptions. You know, early on, suppliers of filter medias were asked to switch gears and use those medias to create PPE. And when you think about it, a mask is basically just a filter for your face. We've seen suppliers of other filtration components shut down completely. 
And on top of all that, overseas and air freight charges have seen increases as much as a thousand percent. So we in the filtration world can certainly understand and empathize with others on the impact of this pandemic. So how can filtration help? Well, filtration is ultimately about improving indoor air quality. And we believe that clean indoor air should be considered a basic human right. For most businesses and, and certainly in healthcare, the most important, important asset we have is our people. And through proper air filtration, we can protect our people from viruses like SARS-CoV-2, as well as from a host of other airborne particles which negatively impact human health. Another way air filtration can help is by reducing operating costs. Too often, the focus in filtration is on initial unit cost, but the reality is that filter replacement accounts for just a small percentage of the overall cost of a filtration program. By increasing awareness and shifting that focus towards the performance of the filters, not only do you see an improvement in indoor air quality and create a safer environment, but you can also realize substantial operational cost savings. And COVID-19 has forced us to adapt and find ways to deliver better ventilation strategies. The swapping out filters to higher efficiencies isn't always feasible. The cost and time required to re-engineer or replace HVAC systems to accommodate higher efficiency filters can be prohibitive. So in these situations, supplemental air filters or air cleaners can be great alternative solutions. So let's take a look at coronavirus from a filtration perspective. Now here's that picture we're all way too familiar with by now of the SARS-CoV-2 virus with its distinctive crown-shaped protein spikes protruding from the envelope. A fun fact here, if you didn't already know it, corona is actually Latin for the word crown, which is where its name is derived from. And these coronaviruses were first identified in the 1960s, but have probably been causing illnesses in humans for thousands of years. They're responsible for common respiratory illnesses, such as colds and pneumonia, along with mild gastrointestinal illness. However, there have been three coronaviruses in recent history that have caused serious diseases. SARS in 2003, MERS in 2012, and of course, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Now this trend in recent history in and of itself suggests to me the COVID-19 may not be the last virus challenge we're gonna see. Viruses and other particles that are harmful to human are very small. We measure them in microns and a micron is one millionth of a meter. So to put that in perspective for you, a typical human hair might be 60 to 120 microns in diameter. When the afternoon sun shines through a window and you can see those dust particles floating around the air, those particles are in the 10 to 30 micron range. Now that's the lower limit of the visible spectrum of the human eye under optimal conditions. Now the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus is submicron in size. It's approximately 0.125 micron. That's 600 times smaller than a human hair. And capturing a particle as small as a virus is a challenge, but thankfully, at least in a filtration standpoint, this virus is not spread by itself, but it's contained within respiratory droplets expelled by infected people when they sneeze, cough, sing, talk, or even breathe. And these respiratory droplets range in size, but the consensus is that they average around 2.5 microns. Still, these are very small particles. It's believed that the respiratory droplets expelled from an infected person by simply breathing into the surrounding air is the primary means by which COVID-19 spreads. The University of Nebraska study showed 63% of air samples taken from a patient isolation room were positive for COVID-2. 
And just this past Monday, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force updated their statement on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. They said, airborne transmission is significant and it should be controlled. Changes to building operations, including the operation of HVAC systems, can reduce airborne exposures. So there's a legitimate concern over airborne transmission of this disease in buildings, and smart air filtration decisions can certainly mitigate that risk. Some key variables in the spread of the virus are the size of the droplet, the time the droplet remains in the air, and the distance from the source. Now, we all know about the six-foot rule. The six-foot rule was based on the assumption that it was the larger respiratory droplets, we're talking uh, greater than five microns, that were responsible for the majority of airborne infections. And droplets of that size are just too heavy to stay suspended beyond that six-foot range. However, respiratory droplets come in a wide range of sizes. These smaller droplets are known as droplet nuclei, sometimes referred to as aerosols. The smaller they are, the longer they remain suspended in the air. And several studies have shown that they can remain airborne well beyond the six foot zone. Now, the exact role that these droplet nuclei and aerosols play in spreading the infection is still unknown, but the potential for these smaller droplets to recirculate through the air handling system means we have to do our best to capture as many of these particles as possible. And we can accomplish that through proper air filtration. Here we see a scale of the particle sizes for various viruses, bacteria, and droplet nuclei. We can see the actual uh, COVID-19 virus there at 0.125 microns. But as we mentioned earlier, the virus is not viable on its own. Our target is the nuclei and aerosols carrying the virus through the air. And while these targets are still very small, from an air filtration standpoint, they are large enough to be confidently captured with high efficiency air filters. A MERV 15A or 16A filter will capture 95 to 100% of these particles. Now, many illnesses and diseases other than COVID-19 are spread by respiratory droplets and aerosols. And as a result, the size and dispersion of human exhaled droplets, it's something that we've done a lot of research on. So while we don't know the what the exact infectious dose is of COVID-19, we do know that a starting point of 0.5 micron is the smallest aerosol, aerosol particle potentially capable of containing a sufficient quantity of virus to be considered a risk. Now that's the small end of the scale. As mentioned earlier, the larger end of the scale are droplets large enough to drop within six feet from the source. So between the low end of 0.5 micron and the high end of five microns, that peak distribution analysis shows a mean particulate size of roughly 2.5 microns. So an air filtration solution with a capture efficiency of 95% or better within this particular range would be a sufficient risk mitigation strategy. Now air filters play a vital role in HVAC systems. Some filters, by virtue of the medias they use, fail to maintain the rated efficiencies over their service life. This drop in efficiency allows more of our targeted particles to recirculate back through the system and potentially infect others that aren't even in the same room as the infected person. Now in comparison, selecting filters that maintain their efficiencies throughout their service life shows that we can effectively mitigate that potential risk and maintain the desired indoor air quality. So what are our filter efficiency options and what are some of the things we should consider when it's like selecting appropriate filters? In 1999, ASHRAE replaced the old 52.1 dust stop dust spot me test method with 52.2, which is also known as the MERV test. MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with filters being referred to as a 45% filter or a 95% final filter. Well, this terminology is a holdover from the old 52.1 test, and it's been obsolete for over 20 years now. 
As a matter of fact, if your supplier is selling you 95% filters, they're not ASHRAE compliant filters for use in a healthcare facility. Filters used in healthcare must have a MERV rating and manufacturers must comply with the full 52.2 test data in order to use that term MERV on their products or in their literature. So the 52.2 uh, MERV test, uh, we're basically just measuring particles in versus particles out. What we do is we introduce particles of three different size ranges to a filter and we record the capture percentage in each of these particular ranges. Based on the filter's performance, we then assign a simple numerical MERV rating to the filter from one to 16. A MERV one rating being not very efficient and a MERV 16 rating signifying a filter that is very efficient at capturing the smallest particles. And the particle capture efficiency of a filter is primarily determined by the media. Filter configuration definitely plays a role as well, but the media itself has the largest impact on efficiency. And there are two basic types of media used in the filtration industry. And essentially it comes down to comparison between fine fiber and coarse fiber. Fine fiber filters like the image on the top capture particles through mechanical principle. Think of it as just like a fly running into a screen. The other type of media often used is a coarse fiber media that relies on an electrostatic charge imparted onto the media fibers for its efficiency. Now at first glance, you look at these two pictures and you think there's no way that that coarse fiber media on the bottom could capture as many of those little red dots as the fine fiber media on the top but these two filter medias both test to the same MERV rating, at least initially. See, so when you first install electrostatically charged air filters, the charge acts to attract fine particles to the media fibers. This allows the filter to achieve its initial MERV rating under the 52.2 test. But after a short period of time, Enough small particles have been attracted to the media fibers that they create a barrier and insulate the charge on the media. As a result, those small particles can now easily pass through those big openings in the coarse media. Now this loss in efficiency is often two or more MERV ratings. So an electrostatically charged MERV 14 filter may only perform at a MERV 12 level. Now it's important for me to note here that Camfield does manufacture filter filters utilizing coarse fiber electrostatically charged media. There are certain applications or circumstances where an electrostatically charged filter is an appropriate solution, but never in a healthcare environment. Now this is a picture of an actual 52.2 test rig at one of our North American manufacturing facilities. So in, in 2007, the ASHRAE 52.2 committee recognized this degradation of efficiency in filters relying on electrostatically charged media in order to obtain their MERV ratings. And they responded by introducing Appendix J, which is also known as the MERV A test. Appendix J is a supplemental test wherein we're adding a conditioning step. We introduce a potassium chloride aerosol to the filter media. This acts to neutralize any electrostatic charge that may be present. We then subject the conditioned filter to the same 52.2 test. So now we have filters that have both MERV and MERV A ratings. The MERV A rating, or as I like to call it, the MERV actual rating, tells you how a filter is going to perform over its entire service life. So when selecting air filters, you should always base your decisions on the MERV A values. This is particularly true in healthcare environments where we're concerned with removing these small dangerous particles. And this slide illustrates the critical nature of MERV A values. Now for most spaces in healthcare facilities that require high efficiency filters, the minimum requirement is a MERV 14. So here we're looking at a MERV test and Appendix J side by side for a typical electrostatically charged filter. This filter tested out at a MERV 14, you can see on the left, 
And on the right, when the appendix J conditioning step is introduced, we can see that this filter drops in efficiency to a MERV 12A. But as we look over here in this, uh, uh, the test results, the percentages of particles captured in that critical size range for respiratory droplets drops from a 78 all the way down to a 26%. That's a huge drop off. This is a filter that has no business in a healthcare facility. In comparison, here we have MERV and MERV A test reports for a fine fiber filter relying on mechanical principles for particle capture. You can see the MERV and MERV A tests are the same. This is a filter that will perform at a MERV 14, 14A for its entire service life. Again, if you look more closely at the performance of the filter in the critical ranges, there's virtually no difference between the two tests. This would be an acceptable filter to select to mitigate risks against viruses contained within respiratory droplets and droplet nuclei. Here we have a comparison of MERV versus MERV A capture efficiencies for MERV 13 through MERV 16 filters. When we target our risk zone over here, you can see that there's a dramatic drop off in efficiency at every MERV level between the MERV A and the MERV's ratings. So if our intention is to create a safe environment in our facilities, we have to look at these MERV A values. Besides, we all want to get the value for what we pay for. If you paid for a MERV 14 filter, that filter should deliver MERV 14 efficiency for its entire service life. So again, the way to ensure this is by making filter selections based on MERV A values. And now I wanna talk a little bit about ASHRAE 170, ventilation of healthcare facilities. The 170 standard details the minimum filtration requirements for healthcare facilities. It's published on a four-year cycle in conjunction with the Facilities Guideline Institute handbook. The 2021 publication of ASHRAE 170 was just released a couple of week, weeks ago, and I encourage everyone on this call to get a copy. It's available through the ASHRAE website in either printed or electronic format. The 170 committee meets on a regular basis in an effort to continually make improvements to the standard in between the four-year publication cycle. And these changes are released in the form of addenda. Now, last fall, there were several addenda to the 2017 publication. The most significant among them was addendum A. The changes brought with addendum A have been incorporated into the now current ASHRAE 170-2021 standard. And there were two major changes uh, with addendum A. The old table 6.4 is gone now. It's been replaced with three separate tables. Table 7.1 lists the minimum filtration requirements for inpatient facilities. Table 8.1, and, and they've actually added in table 8.2 as well, uh, are for outpatient facilities. And table 9.1 for the minimum filtration requirements in residential facilities. Now, these tables are much more comprehensive and much more detailed than table 6.4 was, so it offers a lot of clear clarity. And the other big change was that they've added uh, an addition of Appendix C and the associated notes. Now, in the 170-2021 publication, uh, this has been renamed Appendix D and uh, table D D1 but the content is the same. And I'm not gonna go into the details of the tables here, we don't have time for that, but I do want to comment on Appendix D, I'm gonna call it here. It's a very handy Cliff's Notes version of the tables. What it does is it narrows down filter efficiencies by space into four levels based on the minimum MERV requirement. Level one is for areas or spaces requiring MERV 8 efficiency, level two, MERV 14 efficiency, level three for MERV 16. And you note here, you're seeing an operating room as an example here requiring MERV 16 filtration. That's an upgrade from the 2017 standard. There are several other areas where you have seen changes and upgrades in the minimum filtration requirement. So again, I, I, uh, I uh, definitely suggest you go out and get a copy of the 
of the uh, standard. And uh, lastly, level four here are for areas requiring HEPA filtration. But the most interesting part for me in, in all of this is uh, the notes right below Penix D. And the very first note, note A, and I know that's kind of small, so I'm gonna blow it up for you here. It says, where listed, MERV rating is assumed to be non-degrading. Well, guess what? The ASHRAE 52.2 Appendix J is the only test we have to demonstrate non-degrading air filters by virtue of their MERV A values. So while the standard does not explicitly require MERV A, MERV A values are certainly implied in the language. And uh, just as a side, Canada has, re has required uh, MERV A values for some time now. And most of the rest of the globe is on the ISO standard. And the ISO standard uh, contains a conditioning step very similar to Appendix J. So this is certainly the direction we are uh, moving for. And besides, we need, as we've seen earlier from a uh, uh, risk mitigation standpoint, we want these MERV A values anyway. So now I'd like to segue into how filter performance dictates operational costs. What we're looking at here is how filter choices at the same MERV A ratings impact operational costs. A replacement costs increase as we increase efficiency. You can expect to pay more for a MERV 16A filter than a MERV 14A filter. And you can expect to pay more for say a 4V style filter than you would for a pocket style filter. But the 4V style filter, if you look see here at the uh, MERV 14 value, uh, by virtue of its configuration and having much more media available, it has a lower pressure drop than the, the uh, pocket filter at the same MERV rating. As a result, the 4V consumes less fan energy and also has a lower total cost of ownership than the less expensive pocket filter. So it's the performance of the filter that determines what your overall costs are going to be. Now, how long does that filter last? How much electricity does it consume? These factors are far more important than the replacement cost of the filter and far more impactful than the replacement cost of the filter itself. Now, the fan energy required to maintain airflow across the filters is the single largest cost component of any air filtration program. And guess what? Those coarse fiber electrostatically charged filters load much more quickly than high performance filters will. And that difference in the loading curves of these two filters is your opportunity for operational savings. Sometimes the energy savings alone can be greater than the entire existing filtration spend. So here's another example of how filter performance impacts operational cost. Here we're gonna look at something as simple as a pleated filter and how it can make such a huge difference. This is a MERV chart. And if we have a pleated filter at a true MERV 8A or 9A, that pleat is gonna capture between 70 and 75% of the E3 particulate range. Okay, now this is particulate in ranging in size from three to 10 microns. I remember uh, the lower limit of, the, of what you and I can see is in that 10 to 30 micron range. So we basically can't even see this, but in the filtration world, this is big chunky dirt. If you look over here into the left into our risk zone, the, the E1 range and, and E2 range, <clears throat> this MERV 8A, 9A pleat's not really capturing anything. But that's not the pleat's job. The primary job of the pleat is to protect the equipment. So let's say we say, well, you know, we're trying to save our facility money and we want to, you know, pleat's a pleat. Let's, let's get the cheapest product we can. So when we go to that electrostatically charged pleat, that MERV A is going to drop down to a MERV 5A, 6A while it's out in use. And you can see here that you literally are allowing twice as much of that E3 particulate to go right through that filter onto your coil. So what's that mean in terms of, of, uh, of, of costs? Well, 
there was a prominent hospital out west that made this switch. They went from a, a first cost pleat to a high performance pleat with us. And after about a year, they came back to us and they said, boy, we're really pleased uh, we made the switch. We saved over $100,000 with you this year. And we said, well, that's fantastic, but uh, you got to help us with the math because you only spent $20,000 in, in product with us. How in the heck did you end up saving over $100,000? And what they told us was that they had budgeted every year for coil cleanings because they needed to with those first cost pleats. But the performance pleat did such a great job of protecting those coils. They looked beautiful at the end of the year and they, they were able to forego that expense. So it can make a huge impact. Something as simple as a pleat can just be a big, make a, be a big difference maker. And in, in line with that, uh, the train company did a, sto uh, a, a study on scaling some years back. And uh, what they found was that just a few hundredths of an inch of buildup on the coil can reduce the heat transfer capability of the coil itself by upwards of 30%. So the inexpensive pleat doesn't last as long. You're gonna change it two to four times as often as, an, as a performance pleat. It consumes more fan energy to higher average resistance to airflow. It's gonna necessitate more frequent coil changes and it can come with an additional energy penalty due to lost coil efficiency. What you're gonna find is that making filters based on first cost is almost always your most expensive option. So I like to take a minute to talk about HEPA filters. HEPA filters have extremely high particle capture efficiency on submicron size particles. They're not rated using the 52.2 test standard. So if somebody's talking to you about MERV 17, 18, or 19 HEPAs, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, but HEPA filters are generally tested for capture efficiency on particles 0.3 micron in size. This is the most penetrating particulate size for HEPA filters. And they range in efficiency from 99.97% to 99.9999%. Now the phrase true HEPA is, is commonly used, but it's not an, an actual technical term. But if we were to define it, it'd be something like this. A true HEPA is one that has been individually tested to either the accepted IEST recommended practice for HEPA filters or ISO 29463. A true HEPA is one labeled with the individual scan test for that actual filter. No batch testing, not estimates based on component tests, but the tested performance for each specific filter. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I jumped the gun there a little bit. Oh, no, I didn't. So COVID-19 created a massive demand for HEPA filters. I remember a politician call, at one point calling for HEPA filters in shopping malls, but you can't just run around replacing ASHRAE filters with HEPA filters in an attempt to contain these kinds of threats. You have to make sure your system has adequate depth to accommodate a HEPA filter. Likewise, you have to have, make sure you have the right hardware and sealing in order to ensure that there's no bypass. And obviously, can the fan in your unit handle the extra capacity required of a HEPA filter? Now, there are supplemental solutions available that can deliver quote unquote true HEPA indoor air quality to areas where existing equipment and cost effective re-engineering alternatives aren't feasible. You know, small portable indoor air cleaners like this one seen here in the middle can deliver operating room indoor air quality along with molecular level filtration for smaller spaces. And there are larger units available that not only act as in-room air purifiers, but can also be adapted to exhaust HEPA filtered air out of space and create a negatively pressurized room. So wrapping things up, viruses and other dangerous particulates we encounter in healthcare are very small but through proper filtration with high efficiency filters that maintain those efficiencies, we can effectually, effectively capture them. The key here is insisting on filters with MERV A values. 
So if there's one thing you take away from this presentation today, that would be it. In healthcare, we need to select filters based on their MERVA values. You know, we uh, uh, ask your suppliers, this is the way you do it, is ask your suppliers for that full five page 52.2 test report along with the Appendix J reports for every filter and type you have on site. And evaluate those filter choices based on performance. We saw several examples here of how filter performance ends up saving considerable amount of operational cost. In fact, as you look across the country, if we're to average for every dollar a hospital spends on filter replacement, you're going to spend $7 in operational costs. So it just makes sense to focus your uh, cost savings uh, uh, initiatives in the area where you stand to save the most money. And keep in mind that there are uh, portable air purifiers and air cleaners that can be great solutions to deliver the necessary indoor air quality to spaces in your facility. So that's, uh, that's all I have here. Uh, here's my contact information. I'll give you a second to jot that down. If you <clears throat> don't get it, uh, we can certainly get it to you later. But now uh, we're gonna open things up to questions. And in addition to myself, I have three other uh, panelists here to answer any questions you might have. David Harris is my healthcare segment counterpart for the East Coast. We also have Kevin Wood, our Vice President of Sales Mark and Marketing, and Mark Davidson, our Marketing and Technical Materials Manager. So uh, Lynn, I believe you're going to uh, be handing the questions and guys, uh, feel free to jump in on, on any question if you feel like it's one you'd like to answer. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Very well job, very good job. Um, the first question we have, how do you prevent negative effects on HVAC equipment based upon resistance introduced into the system by higher efficiency system? So, so this is Kevin, I'll, I'll grab that one. Uh, so yes, clearly the higher efficiency filters that you put in your system, the higher the resistance to airflow and then theoretically the higher energy consumption. So as Kyle referred to earlier, what you need to make sure that you do is to select a filter at that higher efficiency based on two things. One, that it has a MERV A rating so that it maintains that efficiency the entire time of use. And then secondly, that that filter has the lowest pressure drop or resistance to airflow profile and it maintains a low resistance for the longest period of time to therefore reduce any energy penalty that you might pay by going to the higher filtration. And if you select the right filter, many times if you're not using a proper filter now, you could actually go to a better performing higher efficiency filter and, and save energy versus what you might be using. So those are the things you need to look out for. Okay, thank you. Next question, do you have recommendations on return air configurations that do a better job of drawing return air safely away, the, away from the occupants rather than potentially across occupant areas? I'll, I'll jump in on that because I had read something about that not long ago and it's been a conversation of topics with some of the ASHRAE committee meetings as far as in the future will systems be redesigned um, where there's more of a laminar type flow in, uh, in general office buildings and healthcare facilities and things like that. In other words, that the, that the supply air comes in from the top and then the return air is generally located down at the bottom with more openings. Almost if you, can, if you imagine how an airplane works, um, if you've been on a plane, you know, you got your supply air up top, but down below by your feet is the return air and there's a regular laminar type flow. It's not exact as you would find in aseptic processing, but it's along those lines. So I think it is true that in the future, there's gonna be some adjustments to configurations that account for that. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, next question, are there any resources or grants or the like to assist nonprofit, non-hospital, congregate in parentheses, healthcare facilities 
with funding to upgrade their filtration systems? Yeah, I, I would look at the uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, it's a government website, DHH, I think it is, .gov. That would be an initial place to look for from a government point of view. And I certainly, we all, we've probably heard of some of the uh, uh, spending that's coming down uh, from the government. So there's going to be a lot of funds available. And I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of organizations that are, that are managing grants, how to get that, uh, how to get those funds to update facilities. So, and, and I think in a lot of cases, they're going to be managed on a state by state or city basis. I'm not sure if anyone else has there anything, heard anything else specific. Yeah, and I would add that where funds may not be available, uh, usually capital expenditures are separate from operating expenditures. But if you select the right uh, air filters that can reduce your operating expenses, then you may be able to shift some of that money into capital expenses to, to help with some of those projects. Okay, thank you. And the next question, in a non-healthcare facility, this person, they're, they're, they're reviewing mechanical schedules and old unit IOMs to, for, an initial, uh, for an initial determination of suitability of MERV 13 plus. A lot of the older documentation re references 50% or 85% filters, the old rating system. Is there a rough equivalency for percent ratings versus MERV? Yes, there are several charts out there and we certainly have one and I can forward that to the person if you give me the name. Okay, we can get that on the question answer printout. I think one thing also to keep in mind with the old system, there was the ice rate efficiency, um, you got an arrestance value and an efficiency value. And people need to be very careful with those two values and understanding that that's why the new 52.2 is much clearer. Correct. Um, I just, I think that's an important part because there used to be two efficiency um, percentages given with the 52.1. Right. Okay, thank you, David. And the next one, um, there are a tremendous amount of questions revolving around the use of MERV 13 pleated filters where only one inch and two inch filter tracks are available. Can you address using one inch or two inch thick MERV 13 pleated air filters? What would your best practices recommendation be for this application and also for non-healthcare settings? So Mark, would you want to take that one? Uh, I, well, I, I, there are two inch MERV 13, as Kyle pointed out, MERV 13A type filters, those are available. The resistance is a little bit higher and you have to confirm that in fact, your, uh, your system can handle that additional resistance. Um, there's also, I think Kyle touched on this at the very end, but there are air purif individual room air purifiers that could help make up for that gap. If you're in a situation where you have a one inch track and a older unit, maybe where the fan is just not capable of that, uh, indoor air purifiers could cover that gap. And also my background came from the food and beverage industry. And we had a lot of situations where we had older units and they only had two inch um, openings but they knew, they knew they needed to upgrade based on FDA recommendations up to MERV 13 and 14 and things like that. And it had high, high airflow. So what they did was reconfigure their units uh, so they would, hold their deep, they would hold deeper 12 inch filters. Now that takes a little bit of work and you'll need mechanical engineers involved. Uh, but once it's completed, it was very successful in numerous situations and they were able to do that and upgrade to the higher efficiency, uh, similar to what you're talking here with the MERV 13s. Yeah, Mark, I'll I think what people need to be aware of is the majority of MERV 13, two and four inch uh, pleated filters that are offered on the market don't maintain that efficiency. And they typically operate more in a MERV seven or eight range. So if you're focused on having better efficiency, 
again, you need to make sure you have the MERV A value and your better solution may be a filter that has a slightly lower efficiency that it maintains as you balance life and energy consumption versus efficiency. Great, great point, Kevin. And so like, as Mark said, there are these two inch uh, filters available with a, a true higher efficiency, say a MERV 13A <clears throat> efficiency. But for the most part, this conversation takes place around pleated filters. And in order to get a, uh, a MERV rating of a 13 on a pleat, you really have to supercharge that uh, electrostatically charge that media. And what you end up seeing is a precipitous drop off in the efficiency of that filter. You'll, we often see MERV 13 uh, charge filters drop down to MERV 8A efficiency. So it really it, it is about, are you trying to just check the box to get a MERV 13 there? Or are you really concerned about the indoor air quality? Because from a uh, uh, an efficiency standpoint, a true MERV 9A filter is going to provide you with better indoor air quality than that charged MERV 13 product will. And uh, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot less in operational costs. Okay, thank you, Carl. Next question for a given technology type, media area, and velocity. velocity is there a way to estimate the number of additional changes required for a higher MERV rating? Example, if a MERV 8 reaches 1.1 1 .1 in 2,500 2, hours, a MERV 13 in similar configuration will reach the same pressure drop in how many hours, in blank hours? I, I'm not aware of any charts that would give you that to, to determine filter life. Um, you're not going to know exactly uh, the condition the filter is operating in. And I, I assume this is question, you're using a MERV 8, and you're going to change it to a 13. You know, how, how many more times do I have to change the 13? Well, one of the charts that Kyle had, he showed what the difference was jumping up in MERV rating. You're going to stop a lot more particulate with that 13, if it's a true 13 and holds its value over the life of the filter. But to determine how much life you're going to get, it's probably going to be, you're going to have to trial it. Um, there would be seasonal effects that would affect that. Humidity would affect it. Um, you know, the location of the air handler where it's pulling in the outside air, there's a lot of things that would affect that application that you'd really have to look at. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, David, that's true. And I would also add that, um that we have a, uh, a modeling software program that accomplishes that same goal, that gives you the opportunity to model that with a very, a very high degree of accuracy. I've used it often over the past 11 years and I'm always surprised at just how accurate it is, but we've got certain data points that we input variables depending upon the facility, where the equipment is located, what the estimated dirt load is, and we can um, uh, very closely mimic exactly what the conditions that filter are going to see and we can give you a real good close estimation of how long that filter will last and you can base your costs with, and it includes energy usage particle capture every all the facets of a, a filter and you know we kind of refer to that as total cost of ownership and we can come up with that data uh, very very close i've always been surprised at just how amazingly accurate that software, mo that modeling software is. Absolutely, Mark, good point. Right, and as David mentioned, we can validate the findings of that model through uh, on-site testing. Yeah, true, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Next question, how, does, how do air handling units equipped with UV lighting impact air filter selection? Well, there are a couple of facets to that. Uh, I think the, the main point is, is that one doesn't replace the other. Uh, UV light is supplemental to air filtration and, and vice versa. The only thing you have to be careful of is UV light can be damaging to synthetic medias. So if you're using charged synthetic medias, which you typically don't want to use anyway, because they lose their efficiency. But if you use those type of air filters and they're in 
too close a proximity to the UV light, the UV light will cause the media to degrade and fail. But other than that, as long as you're using UV light with the proper air filtration and with the proper spacing between the two, the two work uh, great together to, to improve your air quality. Okay, thank you. This is kind of related. Um, many vendors are touting the benefits of UV lamps or ionization equipment to balance higher filtration levels with disinfection capability and coil cleaning. What is Campfield's position on this technology, on these technologies? Um, I, I'll answer that. Um, certainly the, the technologies are valid. UV light does help keep coils clean, keep mold off of coils and things like that. UV light has also proven to, to kill certain airborne viruses and bacteria, depending on the flow rate and the exposure time. So if used properly, it can be beneficial. Uh, ionization can also work, but uh, it has to be under certain conditions. Ionization causes uh, particles to attract each other and theoretically become larger particles of the positive and negative joining each other and then could theoretically be removed by lower efficiency filters. However, the ionization process uh, is, is, is typically effective, but the collection process may or not be depending on where the ionization takes place. So um, you really have to evaluate those technologies and how they're being applied to determine the effectiveness. Okay, thank you. Next question, as energy codes have evolved, the pressure on designers is to reduce the allowable filter loading, thus reducing the overall system static pressure requirements and fan BHP. In light of the added concern due to the COVID pandemic, what do you see the future expectations for filter manufacturers? Reduced recommended loading? Um, I, I would say that the uh, requirements for filter manufacturers going forward are not going to be a lot different um, because uh, ultimately what we're all, always trying to achieve is higher efficiency air filtration at lower average pressure drop. And as system design changes, that will only that need will only get greater. Uh, but there are certain limits to technology of what we can do today, but there certainly will be a lot of focus on um, configurations of, of media, manufacturing of media, and other things that can uh, stretch that envelope as much as we can over the next few years. But certainly higher efficiency uh, filtration and better indoor air quality is going to be important even post-COVID because uh, there certainly will be other risks you know, going forward of different viruses in the future. Okay. And uh, this one might be for you, Mark. The, we mentioned 2021 ASHRAE guidance, but accredited healthcare organizations can't use them until they are adopted. Parentheses current is 2008. Any insight on the newer guidance being pushed through quicker? Yeah, I'm on the, the 170 committee, and I would say that that is a topic that was discussed a little bit, maybe not officially, but certainly uh, behind the scenes. And I think that everyone would like for that to happen. I would say that because of the way COVID has impacted just about every facet of the healthcare industry, I would think if there's an opportunity for those uh, uh, facilities to, to push that time frame. Uh, up a little bit and to have that occur a little bit faster than normal, this would be an opportunity for that to occur. So I guess the short answer is it's a possibility that the time frame that normally occurs for the adoption is gonna be shorter than it has been in the past. Okay, thank you. Next question, does Canfield offer support to building owners for selecting portable HEPA filters and determining equivalent ACH for legacy spaces that do not offer high levels of dilution ventilation? Yes, we do. And uh, the air change rate is important 
uh, for how effective the air purifier is going to be. So we, we, we would look within a certain range to make sure we're, we have the effective amount of air changes. And then the other component would be the placement of the equipment versus the occupancy of the space to try to optimize the, the effectiveness. But yes, we're more than happy to, to look at a specific space and make recommendations on various air purifier configurations that could improve indoor air quality. Okay. What is the anticipated or average time where a MER filter rating decreases? Well, I, I would go back to our modeling software. We can make some estimates on that based upon historical data that we've accumulated. Uh, but the, uh, the drop off in efficiency is, is a factor of a couple of uh, uh, components, uh, ultrafine particles that accumulate on the fibers and also humidity plays a role as well. So there's no um, complete magic answer, so to speak, although the modeling software again comes amazingly close, uh, but it's difficult to say with absolute certainty that a MERV 13 filter will drop to a MERV 11 in two weeks, because again, that's depending upon a couple of variables. What we do know it absolutely will drop, that part is, is known for sure. And the time frame we can get relatively close on modeling software, but for an individual filter and to be able to have a chart that says this MERV 13 will drop to 11 in two weeks, that's not possible because of the variables involved. But based on the hundreds of field tests that we've done, we would normally see that that drop would occur within 30 days. Correct, sometime, yes. Sometimes sooner, sometimes later, but it normally occurs very early on in the life of the product. I think some of our research has shown that it, it can drop in the carton being shipped to the customer, uh, just bouncing around in the truck inside the cardboard box the container it ships in. As well as like Kevin and Mark said, it, as soon as air starts passing through the filter, our, our tests have shown that it drops dramatically. Okay. There was a question, will the slides from this presentation be shared? And yes, they will be. The, they'll, we'll send an email with the links to the material after this session. The next question, what would be the criteria to select a filter type? For instance, if a customer require, requires a F7 filter for clean air, should I use bag filter, mini pleat, or V-bank type of filter? What I would say is the, the answer is based on the amount of space that you have. Um, if you only have the 12 inches of depth, you would want a V-shaped filter to be the best solution as far as combination of high efficiency and low energy consumption. If you have more than 12 inches of space, you would want to consider a pocket or bag type of filter that has a good MERV A rating because those filters often can be used um, without a pre-filter, not necessarily in healthcare, but in other applications. Um, and they can have a, a good combination of life and low energy resistance. So um, the selection really comes down to the depth of space you have available to accommodate various filter options. Yeah, and that's another uh, great place for the uh, modeling software to come into play. We could model different filtration options, assuming you have the space for them and, uh, and compare them side by side. Okay, and this person has been told by a, uh, some, a rep in Mexico says that EPA 10, 11 filters are not considered as true HEPA filters. Is this true? And then the next question, should it be tested as H13 or H14 filters for pharma application? Yeah, there are, there are globally, there are different definitions and standards for HEPA filters. Uh, EPA is a, uh, a designation for a HEPA filter in some areas of the world, not necessarily in all areas of the world. I think typically in North America, we would go with a, an initial definition that a HEPA filter begins at 
a test a filter that's been tested and certified to perform at 97 or 99.97 percent efficient on 0 0.3 micron particles epa filters and one of you guys correct me if i'm wrong i believe they can begin at 95.5 is that correct? correct i think that's correct yes so but again that has to do with what area of the world and what uh HEPA standard that you're looking at. And but I don't remember the second part. Yeah, the important thing of selecting the HEPA filter is to make sure that that filter is scan tested at the factory with a label before it is shipped so that the efficiency is verified and not based on the media rating, but based on the overall filter. Okay, and we have one last question in the chat. So I don't believe this has been asked. With regard to ventilation and recirculation, ventilation dilutes the contaminant, but is very expensive. Would you consider filtration with MERV 13 or higher enough for COVID-19 isolation rooms? Isolation rooms? Isolation rooms isolation require room. HEPA. Yeah, that's... They require HEPAs. Yeah. Okay. So I believe that's it. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I especially want to thank Kyle, our speaker today, did a great job and really appreciate the whole panelist, Kyle, David, Kevin, and Mark for joining us for the Q&A session. So before we conclude, I just want to let you know a recording from today's webinar will be available soon. Um, please keep a lookout for it. Uh, I'll be sending emails with links to the different, um, the presentation and the recording. So again, thank you for attending today's webinar and have a great day.